Welcome back to the Football Fitness Federation podcast. This is episode 286. I'm delighted to welcome onto the podcast today, Ben Simons. How are we doing, Ben? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. How are you? I'm very good, mate. I'm very good. And I've got to say thank you to um, a mutual mutual friend, mutual colleague, uh, that is Steve Thompson, who was on recently, that put us in touch. So big thanks to Steve. Absolutely. Thanks to Dr. Steve. Steve's turned into a bit of a machine, isn't he, from his, his training recently as well. We're going for Olympics, maybe Commonwealth. We might set the bar a little lower at first, but he's uh, he's getting quicker, Steve. Yeah, he's um, yeah practicing what he preaches on the speed side of things. Um, so I've been overseeing some of his sprint training, which has been a really cool project for both of us. Class. No, that's awesome. It's obviously something we're going to cover on this on the podcast today um, around speed and and power plyometric work with with players and tapping into your experience but we always start these episodes in the same way ben and that's on you and your experience your career so far so can you give us a little rundown so yeah um i'm a relatively green coach really i'm only two years out of retirement from olympic sport myself so i was a team gb bobsleigh athlete um went to three olympic games over a 10 11 year career um background in many different sports so i was a multi-sport youth athlete played a lot of sports at kind of county to regional level but i competed in long jump as a junior at national and international level so that was the best sport for me really as far as level of competition studied sports science at uni so was uh, passionate about training and training theory from a young age and at that point, I'd I'd had two surgeries on my feet and ankles. This is at only 19, 20 years old. So I'd stopped jumping at that point and was competing in the sprints and competing for Wales at that point. Um, still had a couple of um, international vests and was aiming really at that point maybe to go to a, to a Commonwealth Games. But didn't really have any bigger ambition than that at that point and was just enjoying doing it alongside my time studying. And... Um, yeah, basically went through a talent um, ID transition pathway to to bobsleigh, which was really quite a random turn of events. Um, there was a poster literally in my university training facility with a picture of four big blokes jumping into a sled. It said, uh, could you push your country at the next Olympic Games? And I thought, I'm probably too small to do that. The boats look huge, but the tests... I like the look of the tests. It was a 45 meter sprint, standing long jump, uh, squat, and the bench press, which was my my area. Like, I was really good at those tests. So I thought if if anything, I'd be good at. I'll just put down some good numbers. Maybe skeleton would be interesting because the guys tend to be a bit smaller. But no, I went along to that testing session, did well, got invited to the University of Bath for the push tests because we've got a dry land push facility there so think of the scene is cool runnings when they're driving that go-kart down a hill it's just a slightly more technical version of that but it's on <laughs> it's on rails so you can't actually fall off the thing a couple of people have fallen off but it's harder to to fall off the thing and at that point it's just pushing a certain time on that push track to see if you can make it to the next stage in the team um, I was too light, way too light, but I put on a lot of mass over over my career, a lot in the first couple of years, which led to some further issues. But still, it got me into the sport and um, uh, a long and pretty decent career. And during that time, I was still competing, still um, doing a master's. So I finished my undergraduate sports science, did master's sports science, and then started the online training thing a few years in because I was kind of forced into the online world because we lost our UK sport funding. So anybody that's not aware of how the funding works for Olympic sports compared to professional sports, the, the UK national lottery funds, funds those Olympic sports. And that's all based on your, your results and what's going on within the sport. We didn't have a great result in Pyeongchang 2018 Olympics. So we lost our funding there. And at that point, I thought, well, I need something remote that I can do to earn money while we were away on tour because we were away for five, six months of the year. I started the online stuff, and that led actually to the in-person coaching. It's kind of weird. That's happening more and more. That would never have happened in the past. It was always you're a coach first, and 
there was a platform for you to put out your expertise online and set up some online remote work with with athletes from that whereas obviously what we're seeing now with the explosion of online training is uh, you've got a lot of online coaches first or all, all completely online and then perhaps moving into in-person afterwards I was lucky to move into I think to move into in-person very very quickly again I was forced in the summers when we were when I was home obviously that gave me an opportunity to work with people in person and I made some very good um, friends at Sheffield Hallam University and was able to join in with research projects and um, get some work experience and stuff like that working with with people and went from there really two years in I've worked with athletes from um, ultimate frisbee to Premier League football so there's been a complete uh, spectrum of athletes that I've worked with but I'm enjoying the journey so um, yeah that is hopefully a brief overview of, of me and, and my background <laughs> Love it. Love it. I want to dive into that in a second in terms of I always like speaking to people that have been involved in different sports on their views of football and maybe how we prepare players for football as well. But just before we do that, how have you found the transition from athlete to coach? Yeah, that's a very good question and a, and, and, and a pertinent point, I think. It's something that isn't I think it's highlighted more so probably in football than, than a lot of other sports. We see how players that retire can often struggle with that transition. You see a lot of play. I see a lot of players now being a lot more um, uh, forward thinking with getting their coaching badges and stuff and thinking about what they're going to do in the future. But you do see uh, people having difficulty transitioning. I didn't expect it to be a difficult transition because I kind of had my toe in the coaching camp already. Mm -hmm. I was over the last four years still uh, still training full time, the last four year cycle of my my Olympic career, but I was coaching on the side. So I thought, well, it is fine because I just dropped the the one thing and I go all into the other thing and I put all my energy into that. But it's a huge change because the main thing is your your routine and schedule completely gets thrown out the window. So I was always bound by the constraints of the schedule that my sport set. And it would be the same for any Olympic or professional sports person. And then everything else slotted in around that. So suddenly when it came to me scheduling myself, it was much harder. You, you almost become slightly institutionalized with knowing if you've had a 10 year career in a sport or in a system, you know that game day is this day. Um, first day of training, I'm back in here. My training day is like this. I've got to be at the park at eight nine o'clock maybe it's physio first lunch at this time train and then times your own in the in the afternoon evening prepare and then go back the next day you get very institutionalized doing that for 10 15 20 years for some people coming out the other side and then having a load of free time at first it's like oh great but then for me certainly i almost yearned a bit of structure and obviously try to set that up for myself and do set that up for myself now just through through coaching and and my different appointments i'll have with with athletes and clients throughout the day but yeah difficult transition not not easy yeah no and i think you're right you do see it a lot in football don't you players transitioning and obviously the the pfa and other organizations do a good job of of guiding players along that journey as well i know but no it's interesting to tap into your experience of it just that's just on um, sorry ben go on yeah i would say that that's one thing that i think is definitely missing in many non-professional olympic sports that there isn't as much support afterwards as, as as they could be and it's nice to hear that football is is doing that a, a little bit better yeah no definitely just on uh, the sport of bobsleigh then what can we take if we if you're a complete novice and you only maybe catch a couple of minutes of it on a um, every time the olympics is on like myself and yeah. without knowing the preparation that goes into it you've briefly touched on there some of the tests that they that you saw initially when you first got into the sport but now with the experience that you've got and the experience you've got working with footballers is there anything we can learn that sort of transfers across well certainly the emphasis on acceleration is is a big one for any field sport really obviously acceleration is 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 huge and just some of the methods around developing acceleration can transfer readily to to football and, and rugby and many sports where acceleration is 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 important 
I think that's one thing that I, a lot of the methods for just building power and rate of force development and the te the mechanics of acceleration specifically are really honed in on those for, for Bob's sake because it's a hugely acceleration dominant sport. So that has been the main takeaway that I think could transfer to other sports. It's obviously completely different. It's so, so, so specialized. But that specific side is obviously a side that can that can transfer. Because the other thing is as well is obviously when we're accelerating the sled, we're moving a external object. But we test a lot of acceleration, just pure sprinting on the side. And it's interesting how the the act of pushing heavy sleds and moving heavy objects through acceleration will improve your acceleration ability. Um, you know, even a much heavier load. So I think traditionally, and some of the the research around this is now becoming clear that in the past, people used to say you don't want to reduce your velocity by, I, I forget the number, it's like five or 10%. Don't use a sled weight that's going to slow you down that much or it's going to mean your mechanics break down and it's going to it's going to cause problems in your acceleration. But that doesn't seem to be the case. You can use very heavy loads in, in acceleration. So I'll, I'll use... Um, a heavy prowler most gyms especially nowadays because gyms have got a lot better a lot of them will have a strip of turf and a prowler in them guys can get in and do some really good work on a prowler for acceleration not just the physical development and the qualities you need and the specific musculature but also some of the technical the, the mechanical stuff that you need to improve for acceleration and that can be dosed into your your gym sessions haven't got a lot of distance in the gym, but you can get on that prowler and do some work, hit some key positions and learn and develop the qualities you need to accelerate well. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I think on that as well, that the resistance side of things where we get sort of, yeah, I know it's different now, but previously we got talked away from the heavy, real heavy work, didn't we? But if you yeah. relate it to different exercises, like a squat, for example, it's something that we've always periodized anyway, isn't it? That if you're on a periodized cycle, there's probably yeah. going to be a cycle of time where you're going to be working in that heavier way. But with this, with the sled or the prowler, we seem to have thought that it was different in some way. Yeah. It was like different camps, wasn't it? It was like his, his strength, his, his strength, his speed. Yeah. And they need to be completely separate or, but then all of the kind of special strength stuff that came out of, of Russia and Verkashansky and co they all loved doing exercises that were kind of somewhere in the middle I just think there's another side, probably more from the the US side, that's been general strength in the gym, speed here, completely different, don't mix the two. But also, especially with the velocity of things, pushing a prowler, obviously way slower than, than accelerating. If you're trying to teach key positions, and I'd always rather force people into key positions and have to over cue them, especially footballers, uh, they'll get frustrated if you just cue the hell out of them. It's just one small element of this very complex game they've got to play i'd rather use constraints to push some key positions and make some mechanical changes parallel is really good it slows the movement down skill acquisition is going to be easier because it's slower and they can feel those key positions so that's a great i'd say that is one of the biggest takeaways pushing and pulling heavier implement implements can improve acceleration will improve acceleration yeah no definitely and you've seen it used more and more with with players and clubs now as well aren't you so it that, that is definitely um, something that is yes. becoming common practice in a lot of a lot of clubs. Super one, common, yeah. one thing I wanted to sort of focus this episode around was tapping into your experience around working with players in season and getting some of yeah. the work that you do with players in terms of explosiveness, in terms of speed development in season, how that's actually structured. So mm -hmm. starting with plyometric work um, that you're doing with players, what what are some of your thoughts around periodizing? When we're looking at these hectic schedules, these two, three game weeks, and so, even more at the minute as well, which is mental. But um, these weeks that are just crazy schedules, how does that impact your periodizing of, of plyometric work with players? Yeah, it's, it's very, very difficult. And one real big difficulty I've had is that I haven't yet had a player consistently that I've programmed from off season into pre season into season, um, at the at the level where the schedule is as hectic as you'll see at you know a Premiership team where they're playing Champions League and Premiership and everything else. Um, but 
I have had to program players at that level just straight off the bat as well without really having much time with them, which has been really, really, really difficult. I'd say with the plyometrics in that case, it's important to make the distinction between multi-jumps and, and plyometrics here, I think, and talking about ground, ground contact times, impacts, and that overall stress on, on the body. So I think a lot of people will um, jumps and multi-jumps, so box jumps and, I don't know, like two or three standing long jumps horizontally. They'll lump those into the plyometric category, whereas strictly speaking, um, they're, they're not. We With ground contact times, um, we're talking about for a true pure plyometric, like 150 to 200 milliseconds. And that's really quick compared to, if you think a counter movement jump is going to be, I mean, some people will be 500 milliseconds on a counter movement jump. You know, it's, uh, it's literally twice as long on the ground. So they're, they're vastly different things, but you develop, you, you can get a lot of the explosive benefits that you want to see from multi-jumps. So the guys that I've worked with in the season, I'll often use multi-jumps and I'll often use them jumping up. So up onto a box, upstairs, for example, just to actually try and reduce the impact slightly because my main focus on the in-season sessions is always going to be trying to get them up to speed and getting a quality exposure to, to max velocity. By and large, that's what I'm going for in these sessions unless there's anything that tells me that we don't want to run them at top speed today. And then I'm going to bring that plan to acceleration. And then that makes you think, well, how many more explosive contacts have they got on top of that? Considering we're already microdosing the speed because they've covered God knows how many kilometers in the games they've played and the training they're doing. And we have the chance now to get in and do this without any fatigue. So what I'm looking for is, is output. I just want high output on a non-risky exercise. So I'll mostly use... A great example is if I can get them into an indoor training center, which I'll often try to do, because we've got a warm environment, free of rain, free of wind, a good surface. So we can definitely get them up to up to speed. They can feel good. And usually there'll be plyometric boxes and a pole vault or high jump bed. So a good example of jumping up in a multi-jump fashion is set up a plyometric box in front of a pole vault bed. They jump up onto the box, up in the air again, land on the pole vault bed. And so they haven't got as much impact because they're not coming down from a height onto the next contact. Contact times are a little longer, but they're still getting the output and the explosive power that we're going for in, in, in those exercises. That being said, I'll often use um, skips, so skips for height or skips for distance, usually in the warm up. So warming up for their speed work, and that that I would still say that's a plyometric contact. It's definitely within the contact time. It's just of a, of a true plyometric. It's just not as intense because they're they're essentially they've got a penultimate step between each jump. It's not like a bound where you're coming down from a height and with maximum velocity into each contact. But we can still make some of the technical changes that we need with the skips. So I'll often introduce plyometrics as well by using skipping. And from a specific standpoint, it's also going to drill them to jump well off one leg running into a contact because that's so important for contesting a header in football is running into a, into a jump and jumping off one leg. And so that's just another way to get some quality contacts in because by and large, that's what I'm looking for is micro dosing minimum effective dose here. There's very little capacity, very little left within there. If we think of it as like a bucket and we're filling that bucket up with water and that's all the training with the schedule they've got, there's, there's very little left really. But what we can do is kind of get the lowest hanging fruit here in this small time I've got with them and just go for some output in the with the least risk possible. And I just see risk with doing higher intensity plyometric movements in season, unless I've worked with them over, um, you know, a, a good amount of time leading into the, the season. So for, I have goalkeepers that I've worked with off season, pre-season, I've worked with for years. And I can do that all of their programming. With them, I'll have much higher um, volumes of, of plyometrics in season. A, because I know that they can handle them and I've coached them to do plyometrics properly. And B, just because 
reactive and elastic strength is way more important for a keeper and they're covering less volume on the field anyway so their training looks completely different um they're, they're just very very different training programs and i've been lucky to to work with quite a few keepers now which is a they're a really cool cohort of athletes to work with i love that i think that's a great point as well in terms of the um sort of training age of the player and the athlete but also the time spent with you as well as a coach i think that's mm. really crucial isn't it but i suppose the hard thing off the back of that comes when coaches are working within a team environment and you've got however many players of all different um, abilities and all different experiences in terms of yeah. jump training or plyos as well. Yeah, plyos are there. Not many people know how to coach plyos. And unless you come from a, a jump background, there's very little emphasis placed on how to do plyometrics properly and also there's not really any consensus consensus on what is uh, correct with like the ground contact and what a pure plyometric is and there's there's a whole lot of mystique around it almost and i think because of that people struggle to they just think well we'll just throw in a few hurdle hops or just make them do some bounds and i'm like yeah i see a lot of people trying to do bounds re really badly and you're just asking for shin pain achilles pain knee pain and when you're when you're working with people whose performance week in week out is so important, like why why risk that? Mm. Why risk that? When I'm looking at what I'm going to use for these players in season, that isn't number one priority. Number one priority for me, especially as I'm mostly a speed coach, is getting them up to speed and getting a appropriate exposure to maximum velocity, and then just getting some some high output and that would be max strength as well as some sort of jumping or throwing exercise i didn't notice that and this is something that is very underutilized explosive throws explosive throws are a great great way to get a lot of the benefits that you want from plyometrics at a, a systemic level uh, without some of the risks and the risks of overuse injury at the, the lower limbs so yeah along with the jumps up that i mentioned before overhead throws for distance and it's great and it's good fun for the guys, you know, if you, um, especially if you get a few into one session, you set up a cone, everybody's trying to beat one another. You, I've never seen somebody get hurt doing those. And I've always seen people get massive outputs because if your mate goes and throws the ball further than you, or even if there's a tape measure out and you didn't get as far as last week, intent goes through the roof. That's it. That's output ticked. I'm good. Good to go. Yeah. And if you can microdose that through, through a season, then come end of the season, I think their speed and power capabilities are going to be trending way higher than they would have been if they hadn't been doing any of that microdosing of high outputs. Also with the throws, it's the, the saving on coaching time, isn't it? Because <laughs> Yeah, massively. Because take it, especially taking a group, you could probably take a whole group through a really effective session using throws that if you're going to do something like plyos or something else, maybe a little bit more complex that's going to take a lot more time, isn't it, than than setting that up? Absolutely, especially if you're working with a, a whole team. Yeah. Like to teach pure plyometrics, it's like you need, a, even with one athlete, you need a good bit of time. And, you know, I'm not somebody that believes, oh, well, you need to hit all of these, these measures, two times body weight squat, X, Y, and Z. I, I, I don't believe any of that needs to be something that needs to be hit and it's not a prerequisite to jump because we were all doing plyometrics as, as kids playing in the playground so but still the technical side of it things can go very wrong like i just see bounds are a good one i'll see bounds thrown into many a sprint warm-up and what people are doing isn't bounded and mm. there's a lot of there's a lot of sore shins there's a lot of short sore shins because uh, they're bounding badly and because they've got a huge amount of volume elsewhere in their playing and training schedule anyway yeah and i think that's the other thing isn't it looking at the big picture because if we're looking solely at the sessions that we're putting on and the volume that we're um exerting on a player that's only one piece of the puzzle isn't it when you stack everything else on top of it like you've mentioned with playing time and training time and the rest of it suddenly you've got that creep well it's not creeping your volume up it's sending your volume up pretty high isn't it massively yeah uh, they've they just got so much on that plate it's such a huge volume to deal with Often I'll microdose into warm-ups and post-session as well. So yeah. the, the the harder, you know, on-pitch session of the week 
training wise we might microdose some explosive throws sprints or uh, multi jumps into the warm up and then on the on the easier day it might be that they just put in a microdose at the end yeah yeah so if they haven't been able to see me in in, in person just to make sure they get the exposures to output and or max v that's needed and then also looking at you know if you if you're if you're working with somebody if a footballer is is with you specifically as 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 your coach which is often not not the case you're dealing with many different coaches because you're dealing with the club um you might be dealing with another outside snc coach another outside physio etc you're part of a, a larger team but if you can get access to the numbers i.e you know because gps is rolled out in many many of the leagues now even lower league you can get how much distance they've covered and top speed as well top speed exposures you can kind of work out how many more exposures they might need that week but like they might have already covered they might have covered it yeah you know if they're a full back and they've had a lot of you know high velocity sprint sprints in a game you're not you probably don't need to do very much with them but if you get them fresh not fatigued in a warm environment with a good warm-up you're still probably going to get them to above what they reached on on the pitch that week which is so kind of super max effort which does a lot of things obviously it's going to keep their max velocity um up throughout a long and grueling season but it's almost like also kind of inoculation to the hamstrings you know the, the hamstrings usually go at, at high speed so if you get them above the, the speed or at least close to max V um, with some microdosed exposures, then that's going to create a kind of inoculation for the hamstrings or at least reduce risk of, of hamstring injury. And it also gives you a chance to look at how they're moving because you're going to spot any aberrant or wayward mechanics that could expose them um, to injury risk. Yeah, definitely. How does your approach then differ then in season when? You, it's very rare, I know, but you might get a player who has a break for a week, possibly two weeks, so international windows or for whatever mm -hmm. reason, we've got a block of time in season where we can get some work into players. What would be the sort of difference in approach? Yeah, so lo I'd load them up. I'd, I'd see an opportunity like that. It's almost a, <laughs> sometimes a godsend for a coach. You're like, oh, good, I've got no competing variables here and we can just get a, we can just get some work in. I've got a goalkeeper at the moment who through some, and this is another thing dealing with kind of politics and all stuff that goes on in football, through some weird um, loan agreement versus politics between loan club, club that he's with, et cetera, this keeper was was benched for a while, even though he was the top keeper at the club, doing really, really well. And he was, he was playing exceptionally. So he's like, mate, for the foreseeable, you know, I'm training, but I'm not playing. So I'm like, okay, let's, let's go for it. Let's load you up. So yeah, we take the shackles off. We get them in the gym. Max strength is often the you know obviously along with max velocity, but we're we're talking with about a goalkeeper here. Yeah, the the max velocity side just I still use I still sprint them because it's just the development for the central nervous system, but also their hamstrings take a hammering with the long balls. So I'm very careful with it. Max strength really lowest hanging fruit here. So really good amount of max strength and a lot of high output stuff multi jumps uh, explosive throws more players with the keepers anyway he's done this for a few weeks got back on the field and yeah it's just giving him a new lease uh, this was just before christmas leading into the new year just came out flying you know he got that extra big dose of training in it's almost like a periodized approach with a uh, like track and field where you might have early early year competitions where you've got to qualify for olympic games and world championships and then you go back into training, come back out again, peak again. So you can almost do that kind of super comp super compensation peak, peak trough, peak trough. Gave him a big load. And then he got back on the field, tapered him off slightly, back into an in-season approach. And he's absolutely flying. So, yeah, I just see them as a nice opportunity to um, to get some good work in. And that is often when um, the players may come up and see me if they've got that kind of break. I think there's two ways that players will go in that period isn't there they'll either do that and they'll go and get that work in and reach out to someone like yourself that knows that it's an opportunity to work differently get in that work and, and come back in a better position but the battle i think for with a lot is that players just want to stop players want to just step <laughs> away because they've had busy periods and yeah. 
kind of understand it because they've had quite a bit on, but I suppose the education side of it there is really needed, isn't it, to say, yes, you've not got your game load, but for you to play out the remaining however months, how many men, uh, however many months of the season, we need to get you at this level, and that's exactly yeah. what you've referred to then, isn't it? Yeah, and it's a it's a different it's a different load, you know. Just the the stress of playing ninety minutes two or three times a week sometimes uh, that that's different to being able to get them in, offering a little bit more density to their strength training, doing some more explosive work. And you would hope that the kind of aerobic and endurance benefits that they had got through playing that often over the last few weeks, we know that those those adaptations last longer. So for an international break, for example, it's not a particularly long period. You can kind of go in, you're, you're changing really the emphasis of the training. Um, so I haven't noticed, they're going to come in with niggles, but you you work around that, right? More often than not, appropriate strength training can can offer a bit of a solution to a lot of those niggles as, as well. Same. So yeah, you know, obviously I've flown in with load them up, load them up, but I would say, yeah, you've still got to be mindful, especially if someone's completely fried. But my experience has been the kind of change in approach with it being more strength, explosive based work that does still offer a break from the, just the huge amount of, of volume that they're getting um, through playing 90 minutes of football multiple times a week. And then do you see that difference then with these players that you've built up this strength base with as well, that you've maybe had for, I know you've said about having players for a certain amount of time, their work in season in terms of the the strength exposure that they're getting in season can now be different to players that are, that haven't seen you for as long or the training age is a lot, a lot lower. Yeah, I would say so. If you get in a good amount of work in the off season and pre-season, then I mean, we see it in the research, right? If you build up certain physical qualities, they'll last for so long. If you give appropriate doses after that, they'll last for, for even longer. So if you've had a good block of training in your off-season and pre-season, then that's going to take you much longer through the actual season itself. So I think, yeah, building up a good level of strength is always going to serve play as well. And it probably is the lowest hanging fruit, really, from what I see in in, in football. Is just not appropriate maximum strength training. Yeah, that that's one thing I was going to ask in terms of sort of common areas that players need that work. And you say that is the main one. Yeah, so obviously for me, I'm a speed-based guy. Sprint mechanics, sprint mechanics. And that's not saying that mechanics, they're not going to run like Usain Bolt, but there are some commonalities with risky movement and efficient movement in both acceleration and top speed, which can carry over from like track, for example, to to football. And it's going to do three things. It's going to improve their maximum velocity and acceleration, which is going to make them quicker on the pitch in general. And it's going to make them more efficient runners, which is then indirectly going to improve their capacity, right? If they run better. And then it's going to reduce risk of injury. So if their sprint mechanics are better and less risky, it's going to reduce risk of uh, hamstring injuries, uh, lower back issues, groin issues, of course, um, tendinopathies of the, the Achilles. And also the exposure to high speed. We get that kind of inoculation effect, at least a little bit of injury reduction at the, specifically at the hamstring, I would say, but but everywhere, you know, if you expose somebody to a stimulus, they're going to get used to it. So, yeah, for me, high speed run, running and running in general and sprint mechanics, max strength. Yeah, it's just massively underutilized for whatever reason. And I can understand because it's <laughs> it's many generations away from what's going on on the football pitch. Right. If you think if people are skeptical about speed and sprint mechanics in football, because it's like, oh, it's not the same. They've got to do it for 90 minutes even though that is a very key element to what they do on the pitch, then you can understand why people are skeptical about doing a squat, which is completely different. It's a completely different sport. It's, you know, from a layman's perspective, you don't see how that is related, but we all know the benefits of, of, of mass strength, max strength will carry over to marathon runners do strength work. You know, it, it will, it will carry over. And I think there's just been a trend to, underload players i think we're seeing that massively especially in clubs but i think that might be it's changing but i think also that's you can understand it 
it's through fear and it's through risk uh, management it's through um managers and staff maybe not believing in it or not being something that they did in their career but i think as sports science is becoming more there's always a kickback you still hear people kicking back against sports science but as sports science is becoming more and more prevalent in clubs i'm seeing more and more good max strength work going on in clubs i'm seeing more and more great snc's that i've um, been lucky enough to kind of speak to in the past who are working in top clubs um how much their hands are tied by who's above them i mean that must be a hard relationship for them to to deal with you know manager to them to players but at the same time i think it's changing so yeah um i'm going off track a little bit i would say yeah speed and sprint mechanics max strength and just high outputs in general so that's a really easy bucket to to fill right yeah you don't need a lot of volume it's especially if you use the right modality explosive throws multi jumps you can get some good changes and adaptation in the players in a fun way um with with very little impact on the rest of the the program because you just need so little volume of it yeah i know it's a great point yeah what you were saying there about the, the squat um and people looking at it in a slightly different way just reminds me of the comment that the, i can't remember the chelsea manager from years ago saying about that we don't carry laptops on the pitch or whatever the quote was and basically <laughs> saying that the, that the sports science didn't relate and it's like okay oh, right is that's where we're at is it but yeah that's the kind of <laughs> yeah. thing isn't it well i'm sure I, I heard a quote from i think it was andrea perlo saying the um the pre-match warm-up is just the strength and conditioning coach's way of masturbating <laughs> <laughs> it was obviously you translated from italian but yeah like i kind of i kind of get that i do <laughs> yeah sometimes when i see ladder drills in warm-up i'm like yeah they, they probably don't need to do that uh, yeah at that point i think I, I don't know i'd be very unless a player was uh yeah some players have been really kind of the really keen guys want maybe my thoughts on like pre-match potentiation stuff like that especially the keepers i think um and i have given them like potentiation protocols to use but i think really at that point players has need to be in the game and really quite intuitive about what what they need for me personally as an athlete i always had a warm-up that i thought was appropriate for myself uh, if yeah. you experienced enough i don't think your hand needs holding at that point um but it really you've got to take the team aspect into it as well if everybody's been in an individual before a game then how's that going to um, affect the team performance so I can understand why maybe the more um, scheduled and strict warm-ups come in that are led by by the staff yeah it's also obviously someone like that it's also from a very technical based player isn't it who's had a career well, exactly. based, based on technical ability probably more than physical yeah, he didn't even look like he was breaking breaking a sweat half the time when he played. But if you've got someone, um, yeah, you've got someone that really relies on their speed, <clears throat> full back, wide midfielder, you want to get them ready. Christ, they don't want to break into their first like top speed run of the game and feel like they're they're not ready to go. Yeah, and it's um, yeah, it's one of them. But those are the really getting into the minutia of the of the of the sport now. Ben, just to before I forget, because I was going to ask you this before, when you mentioned about acceleration and um, putting sort of sprint mechanics as a, as a, a priority for a lot of players and something that, that probably needs to be learned more by coaches and, and used more with players, what would you say are some of the common areas we should focus on in terms of what you've seen with players impro on improving acceleration? Yeah, so... You kind of, especially, especially with with footballers, you can really go to the to the simple kind of key points in acceleration. Um, projection is the main one, and a lot of players that people will be skeptical about projection because they think it, it makes them unbalanced. I don't expect them to be accelerating like um, Usain Bolt at the blocks, head down. Obviously, it has got to be up. But it's it's the way you're projecting the center of mass, projecting the hips especially, and a lot of the time they're not projecting enough aggressively enough horizontally, and so they're kind of just running on air, you know. So learning to project, and a lot of that will come from the the multi jump and the throw work that we do as well. 
um, especially if you're jumping out and forward and throwing out and forward. So there are crossovers there to to what we're doing in the in the explosive work or special strength work, whatever you want to call it. And I think there's a lot of issues around um, lumbar pelvic control as well. And this is really a lot where drills kind of get get a lot of flack in the online space at the moment from certain sides of the online space anyway even within track and field there's people that are like anti-drill you know running drills sprint drills so like it's not the same it doesn't prepare people for x y z look it's it's getting you into into key positions and at least allowing you to um develop some movement literacy especially around the i see the the lumbar pelvic region and yeah not only is that going to reduce risk of of back injuries and back pain but especially the hamstring you know when you can't control your pelvis and you're stuck in an anterior pelvic tilt then that puts the hamstrings inherently at risk of risk of injury and i do see that and you see it with often it won't be as obvious or illuminated in acceleration but when they then transition to to top speed it becomes very obvious and you'll see it all the time. Might be good over 10, 20 yards. If it goes a little bit further, head goes back, arse goes out, and they start literally butt kicking and just wheeling out behind the body. That's going to be kind of more exaggerated than in, in track and field, for example. The You're playing on grass. They're going to use a more uh, ground-based strategy, right? The floor isn't going to be as reactive as if you're using a, a track or probably even some astro pitches that you'd see in the NFL especially if it's wet you know so they're going to be spending a little bit longer on the floor it's going to be a ground-based strategy that can often help the acceleration we don't want to be having loads of air time and i think there is a, a bigger issue there when one of the main things that needs to be taught in acceleration one of the earliest things is to push it's simply quite simply pushing horizontally so the easiest way to kind of teach more efficient acceleration but what you get with that is players kind of bounding or jumping out yeah and almost spending too too long in there so you've got to be quite careful with 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 how you cue it because they still and you will see games players especially running differently to to track track stars makes sense they're playing a different game yeah they also need to they can't be up in the air in no man's land They've got to get their foot down to control the ball for a lot of the time. What you will see is great players transition in between the two. Like if they're on the ball, their actual strategy will will change quite quite vastly to if they're actually making a break. I think like somebody like Gareth Bale's probably in, or Ryan Giggs back in the day, a really good example. If you just look at their their frequency and what they're doing with their feet when they're dribbling versus and Ryan Giggs and Gareth Bale are great examples. If they just did one of those runs where they just knock it 20 yards past the the defender and they just rely on their wheels they just switch into track star yeah like there's there's no there's no anterior pelvic tilt they're not leaving their their legs out behind they can just kind of switch from having to use the floor and not be up in space where they can't actually get their foot down to the ball to boom high knees like usain bolt flying on the wing so but then not everybody can do that you know not everybody can do that there, there, there is a certain amount of inherent kind of God-given ability to that. Both of them would have run well on the track as well as good on the field. Um, but quite often it doesn't work the other way. Like, did you see Usain Bolt playing charity matches? Yeah, yeah. I think Jamie Carragher beat him to like one of the little 15-yard <laughs> balls or something. He just got his body in the way, knew where it was going. <clears throat> you, yeah, you, Usain lost a step on him. Yeah, it's not the same. It's different. It's different. So I think that's another thing is... It, and I've had to have this conversation a lot because you will get the naysayers that will just question like what you're doing, like you're you're a you're a speed specialist, like it's not the same for football, blah, blah, blah. So I've had this argument a lot and I've thought of it, thought it through and through. And yeah, it's it's different. But we can still have a lot of take homes from and a lot of there's a lot of advantages to training speed with players. Speed kills, it's a massively important part of the game. It's just slightly different from how we train a track star. Hundred percent. When you were talking before, I had that goal that Gareth Bale scored in El Clasico when he knocked it round. Possibly yeah. Busquets. Yeah. Maybe not Busquets. One of the players, anyway, and went off the pitch and came back on. And then that's exactly what you mean. Yeah. That's the one I was thinking of. Yeah. I, I wonder whether that was. I think he's got the highest GPS recorded top speed. 
I think maybe it was that that run. Yeah, um, it was I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure it was 38 um, kilometers an hour, which um, I mean is is huge, especially on grass with fatigue. It's it's yeah. incredible. Yeah. It's incredible. And obviously nowadays, and you get it a lot. There's a lot of uh, clickbaity um, titles coming out from certain news outlets and Instagram pages saying, "Oh, such and such a player <laughs> ran this much quicker than Usain Bolt." Yeah, and they're using like average speed versus top speed, um, and it's just completely, completely flawed. And it's a silly argument anyway. It's um, you know, in in track and field, top speed is the especially in the 100 meters, the guy that reaches the highest top speed wins. And those guys are built for top speed. It's very, very different. Um, it's very, and, and I think, and then people will say, oh, well, 38K is nowhere near the pace of the track sprint. Of course it's not, but it's still incredibly impressive. On that surface with that sort of fatigue, really, really impressive. I'm sure it's like, I'm sure it's probably going to equate to like 10, 5, 10, 6 speed for the 100 meters which um, people might look at you and say, well, there's this women running that, yeah, in, in, in spikes on, you know, after training their whole lives on a track surface with a tailwind. Yeah, it's very, very impressive. And yeah, that's the great example. That break by, by Bale, I think, is one of the, the better examples, yeah. And there's also the fact that you've got another person that can make contact with you. You've got a keep control of the ball. He went off the pitch as well, didn't he? So obviously the surface is probably going to change off the pitch as well. Yeah. There's so yeah. many factors in that, which is absolutely crazy. But yeah. Yeah. He, he really was a freak athlete. A joy, yeah. joy to watch. Um, absolute joy to watch. Yeah. Um, and you, you, you do see this freakish displays like like Cristiano's jump for that, that header, I think 265 height for, it, for his head um, off one foot having to see where the ball is off a grass surface in football boots. Very, very, very impressive. And the landing yeah. on that one as well was ridiculous, wasn't it? Because his upper body was rotating as he landed and he stuck yeah. it on one one foot basically as well. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. That's why I don't working on snap downs and landing mechanics, silly thing to do. It's not yeah. needed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not needed. I just think it's uh, it's a waste of time. And that was incredible, and it's absolutely flown by. Um, we've done it has, this. hasn't it? I can't believe we've got through almost an hour. <laughs> <laughs> we could we could have kept going forever, but I, I respect your time, and I know you've got plenty going on at the minute, so I really appreciate you coming on and doing it. Um, I think we covered some really cool stuff in there as well. So, yeah, big thank you for coming on. No problem at all, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm, yeah, I am super busy just organising the, the off-season work for for the pro players that want to come along and train up here. It's me and Steve and... Um, uh, we're working with boxing science, great gym up in Sheffield. Um, Danny was worked with many pro boxers, uh, you know, the, the highest of levels. So with the endurance stuff, um, we often go to Danny and he helps out. And the nutritionist uh, at boxing science, also the um, former Sheffield United nutritionist, has now gone independent with boxing science. So yeah, we're holding the camp up here. So it's just really taking some organizing. Um, to to get that all all together for June, so I'm going to be straight onto that when we get off the school. Brilliant, mate. But just give people the details of where to keep up with your work. Yeah, so Instagram personal page is at Ben the Bounce. Um, my business page is at Semtex Systems. So there's a little bit more football specific content uh, with some of the players I work with on Semtex Systems. But for tips and tricks and just videos of me working out then go to Ben the Bounce, um, YouTube, Ben the Bounce, and website, semtechsystems.co.uk. Amazing, mate. Thanks a lot for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on.